yeah, part of the MRSD program. Uh, this project was possible due to the guidance and support of our wonderful sponsors, both Red and Caterpillar. Uh, humanity has come a long way since the first moon landings. And space is not just about exploration anymore. It is time to start building things. And there are many people around the world working full steam ahead to ensure the future of our species in space. This would require extensive infrastructure out there, but there's a catch. It is extremely dangerous and exhausting for humans to be out there building things, but it's the perfect opportunity for our robots to shine. So what will this endeavor look like? Allow us to walk you through a mission of the future. A lander has just landed on the moon, and when the doors open, out comes a robot named the Lunar Autonomous Regolith Excavator, or Lunar X for short. But before this robot can dream of building the cities of future on the moon, it needs to start simple. It first needs to build a berm, a fundamental shape of construction, which is used to build barriers and outline layouts. When rockets will be taking off or landing from the landing pads near the settlements, the rocket plume or exhaust can harm the infrastructure and humans near it. But a carefully constructed and placed berm can avoid this harm to both the infrastructure and humans. So what does a robot need to start building this berm? It needs to know two things. The first thing that the operators will tell it is what to build. Today, for the purpose of this demo, we'll be building a berm which is 15 centimeters high and 75 centimeters long. The second thing it needs to know is where to build this berm. So today, we'll be building the berm in that half of the sandbox. With this information, the robot is ready to start its operation. On Zoom, as well as for our in-person audience, we have a screen which is visualizing what the robot's perspective is of the operation. The robot will first start collecting the material. So let's talk more about it. What do we use to excavate here on Earth? We use the big wheel loaders that have been perfected over the years. They rely on their heavy weight to get the traction required to excavate sand. But we don't have as much weight on the moon. On the moon, we only have one-sixth the gravity. And because of this low weight, we cannot have very heavy uh, machines. So we have to use specially designed tools, such as the one on the screen, that is the NASA's ex uh, Razor Excavator Platform, which allows it to excavate in low gravity environments. Inspired from this Razor Platform, we built our own moon loader, the Lunar X Platform. This loader has a bucket drum excavation mechanism which, when turned in one direction, can excavate material, which, was, which is what it was doing. And if rotated in the opposite direction, it will deposit all the collected material, as you will see in a moment. So what is our system capable of? Our system can excavate nearly nine kgs of sand per excavation cycle, and each of these cycles lasts for about two to three minutes. Given enough battery power, our robot can excavate over two tons of material per day. Right now, the operation that you see is completely autonomous. There is no human controlling this operation. To enable this autonomy, the robot has to answer four crucial questions. This is where it is, what it has to do, how should it do it, and did it succeed in doing it? And how we enable the robot to answer this question will be explained in detail by my teammates. So allow me to invite Hari to explain this further.
thank you dhruv so how does the robot know where it is with respect to the work site so how does it localize itself on earth we rely on convenient technology such as, such as global positioning system but the moon does not have any infrastructure yet for the position we use the roller station that is, that you can see in the right corner of the moon yard the roller station is a camera head that that shoots a laser and tracks the reflective prism that is mounted on the robot additionally we have wheel encoders that are attached to the attached to the wheels that gives the velocity of the robot and an imu that measures where the robot is heading or facing towards so now the robot knows where it is within the work site but how does it know how to what to do when the given given task let's say we have a uh, we have a scenario where the robot has to build a berm as shown in the slide with within operating within a boundary region so there are multiple ways to build the, build the berm we can deposit one layer and then deposit more material on top or we can build section by section basically there are infinitely many possible solutions on how we can execute the plan but to simplify things we divide the berm into multiple segments once the segments are done the robot can visit the robot should ideally visit all the segments and deposit the required material for the desired height so why do we need the task planner why can't we just randomly visit all the segments and just deposit material so for the the case demonstrated here there are only eight sections and this is a fairly simple case and it is true that we can visit the segments in any order and uh, and construct the berm but let us consider a case where we have to build a circular berm if we randomize the execution and let's say the robot starts building the segments that are immediately in front of it after a point the build the berms that have been the segments that have been built themselves hinder the access to regions from where we can build the remaining part of the berm sections so considering cases such as these we have developed the task planner the task planner accounts for all combinations and sequences for the berm sequence uh, berm segment segments possible and visits all the and preventing any blockages and gives the optimal plan to be executed one such solution for the case of the circle uh, circle berm could be first building all the segments that are farther from the robot and then building the uh, ones in the front after coming out of the circle this way we have not only visited all the segments that uh, that needs to be uh, built but also prevent the robot from getting stuck into the circle now that the robot has a plan in mind i invite vivakar to talk more about how the robot executes the plan uh, thank you hari so now that we have seen how the robot task plans for the operation we will now have a look at how the robot executes this plan the first step in this endeavor is to dig material autonomously so intuitively this process is very simple the robot needs to uh, put its drum at a particular height under the soil and then keep rotating it its drum till it is full but the terrain that we traverse in is not always very straight say that we start excavation at a particular height as we move down the excavation cycle we might end up in a situation where the ground is lower than the drum in this case we would not be ex excavating any material and in the case where the ground is higher than where we started at we might end up overstressing the tool and even breaking it so how do we solve this problem the answer tool power we uh, we use two simple uh, intuitive facts to solve this issue the first is that uh, if we have more material in the drum more power will be required to rotate it and second if we are excavating too deep more power again will be required to excavate the drum these two facts give us the recipe to solve this problem uh we use uh, we basically give the drum a target desired tool power to follow and as we want the tool to excavate more material as we go down the cycle we increase this target over time now let us look at the same two failure cases but this time with tool power feedback let's say we do not have enough material under the drum for excavation in this case the power consumed by the tool will be lower than the desired uh, value and we would command the tool to go down now if there is too much material in front of it we would uh, command the tool to move up 
in this way we would keep adjusting the height of the tool to ensure that we are excavating the right amount of material throughout the cycle so once we have excavated the right amount of material how do we traverse to the final deposition site in the terrain that uh, we are operating in it is uh, bad for the robot to take a turn where it is located at because this would create grooves into the soil and make the terrain untraversable therefore we use a hybrid a star planner which computes the path from a start location to the end location in the minimum number of sharp turns once we have the path we use a regulated tour pursuit controller to command the robot to track this path now that the robot has arrived at the location where it has to deposit the material in the question next is how do we deposit the material in the right location so that we build a bomb let us look at the situation from a top down view and let us say that the robot has arrived approximately correctly to the location and it needs to position itself with the previously deposited material in order to build the bomb it first switches on its cameras and detects the previously built segment then it uses this information to calculate the commands that it has to take in order to approach the bomb in the right position and orientation in this case the robot is commanded to go forward and to turn left once the robot has executed these actions it lowers its drum and deposits the material and in this way we have finished one cycle of autonomy now that we have seen how this cycle looks like i would like to invite anish to talk more about how does the rover measure success thanks for bagar now that we have seen how the rover knows when to begin operations let's see how it knows when to stop to evaluate its progress the rover needs to estimate the height and length of the constructed bomb and to know how well it has done it needs to estimate the error from the goal equipped with stereo depth cameras the rover is capable of uh, perceiving its environment in three dimensions uh, for every uh, for every patch of the bomb the rover estimates the height in patches of 1.5 cm here the higher elevations are denoted in black bars and the lower elevations are denoted by white bars the rover uses a bird's eye view approach to calculate such elevations for each of the patches of the bomb to get a an elevation map next to estimate the length of the bomb the rover cho chooses the highest points in each cross section and simply takes the length of the peak line to get the length of the bomb to refine its progress the rover the, uh, the rover compares the constructed uh, peak line with the desired bomb peak line estimates the deviations from the peak line to ascertain the final error next to get the height of the bomb the rover divides the bomb into sections of drum bits and reports the high, height of the highest elevated point in each section now that we have seen how the rover constructs an elevation map of the bomb it similarly constructs an elevation map of the entire environment wherever it traverses in a similar way zooming out the rover the map that the rover has constructed today looks like this here we could see a visualization of the elevation map that it has constructed while traversal again the higher elevations are denoted by black pixels and the lower elevations are denoted by lighter pixels as the rover approaches its final uh, deposition we wait for the rover to complete its operations and evaluate its progress here the rover has constructed an a map of its environment where the black regions are denoted by areas it is not supposed to traverse to this corresponds to uh, to the corner location of the total station and the area where the bomb is built in order to not destroy it
the environment that it has constructed also enables the rover to evaluate its progress at any time uh, at any time of operation the rover is moving to its final park location right now okay now the rover has completed its operation and let's look at what the rover thinks it has built the rover reports a final height of around 13 cm and a length of 76 cm i invite dhruv to measure it and uh, see if it's actually uh, how close it is to the right value Exactly, thirteen, fourteen centimeters. This side it's about fifteen centimeters. This repeater for zoom. Yeah. So we have manually evaluated the berm, and we found out that the constructed berm is. Uh, between uh, 14 cm in one one section and 15 cm in the other section which is which is quite close to what the rover has evaluated autonomously so today the construction site post operation looks like this in the future our uh, our system can be scaled up to construct lunar launch pads to enable space flight missions to the moon to summarize our rover is capable of aut operating autonomously and building berms of more than 15 cm height and more than 13 cm long in every cycle it is capable of excavating 9 kg of material in less than 2 minutes of operation time with this we would like to conclude our presentation and we would like to express our heartfelt thanks to R professor red eric Professor John, Professor Demi, the Crater Grader team, and Tim and Chuck from Field Robotics Center. Thank. You. We are open to questions. So the length of the bomb uh, was uh, just to add to the note. Uh, the length of the bomb was uh, evaluated as seventy-six centimeters by the rover. And as we uh, measure it manually, it comes out to be. How we measure it is that the height, any height above thirteen centimeters, is counted as the peak length of the bomb because we have an error tolerance of two to three centimeters. So I measure it slightly below the peak, which should be at around thirteen centimeters, and this is exactly around seventy-six centimeters of length. Okay, a tough, great job, guys. Okay, um, very clear. Thank you for the walk through. Uh, two questions. The first one is: Can you speak about the rate of, you know, you, your requirements like seven kilograms in four minutes? I don't know if you're doing any measurements on the weight and the rate of depositing some material. Uh, we have. <clears throat> also, sorry. Uh, to repeat the question for Zoom, uh, the question was that: Are we doing any measurement on weight? to uh, measure the uh, rate of the system and the answer is currently no we do not have weight feedback directly we know based on our visual feedback how much of the drum collects we've run ex uh, extensive tests where we have an excavation cycle and then we measure the the weight of the dump of, of the sand and we found it to average at about 8 kgs even though the drum is maximum capability is 9 kgs yeah The reason why I ask because it's the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Can you correlate parents to weight? Yes. Okay. So. Then time and then calculate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so uh, we can uh, correlate the current to the weight where the current of about 3.5 amperes of rotating the drum correlates to around 8 kgs of sand inside the drum all right and the uh, so the question is, have we tried to do any of this without the total session, just with wheel odometry? And the answer is, we did look at the data. Uh, it was not uh, possible to work just with wheel odometry because there is a lot of wheel slip throughout the sand, especially when it is turning. It drifts a lot. So, it, yeah. During the deposition, I was I had gone in and rusted away final particle. And I understand people were talking about that you would certainly be able to recognize that in your sensing. The algorithm now I'm currently able to say, "Looks something that I laid down is gone now. I need to actually do a little bit more." Than that. So uh, the question is that can the robot dynamically? sense that whether the berm has been uh, completed or not at each of the segment or if someone has messed with the berm so that it's now not up to the mark of what it needs to be so the answer is currently no the task planner and the visual servo and uh, the perception pipelines are although capable and communicating whether each of the segment has had the dump which was required by the user it's not acting on it currently, but it does have the information. We plan to enforce that for the next demo in the on yeah. Please tell guys, uh, I just had a small question. So let's say uh, due to elevation differences, mm -hmm. there is a situation in which you only need like two more kgs to be put on the bump so that a final bump is completed. Mm -hmm. In that case, the system has that thing that it will only connect two kgs and only empty two kgs on top of that. Yeah. Let's repeat. Yeah. So to, to repeat the question, uh, so is the robot capable of detecting any like just uh, minimal uh, addi addi uh, volumetric additions to the berm to finish the uh, con construction? So the answer is so we have a threshold like uh, we'll see. So how the dynamic planning, which is not active yet, but it is implemented, is uh, it measures the height, current height, and then it estimates the volume of the berm in that particular section, and we know that volume that is being uh, dumped at each cycle so we find the remaining volume to be dumped and then we take the we divide it to see number of uh, dumps that is required more and and if it is if the in the volumetric sense if it is above some particular threshold it will uh, proceed to dump more or it won't uh, it will just uh, move on to the next section to uh, to add to that uh, the drum is uh, so we because we do not have direct weight sensing we do not have the capability to just partially excavate we wouldn't know if it has just partially excavated two kgs because uh, the current change in just two kgs is too low uh, for the errors to take over so we cannot accurately measure the weight currently and that is one limitation of the system yeah so right now all the tracks are going uh, along one path and it's pulling up material from one area. Is mm. it currently going to use the depth sensing to detect that it's making void and potentially stop in there, or is currently just have one place that it's doing? So the question is, can the robot detect whether it's uh, excavating too much material from an area? Uh, just using the depth. So the, the answer is currently it does not. What we have uh, built is that we can define an excavation zone and it will only excavate in for a particular run for two to three times, which is what we know for this sand. But an, in an ideal system, it should be capable of uh, detecting where it can excavate and where it can't uh, without any user feedback. But this system is currently not capable of that. To add to that, uh, currently the uh, trajectory cost map, tra traversal cost map, uh, has only hard limitations on the areas mentioned in black. But we can definitely uh extend the system to also have uh regions with low very low elevations to have a higher cost on the travels uh traversal map uh just for like the demo we wanted the rover to like take more like straight uh tra trajectories instead of curves so that's why uh we haven't showed in this demo yeah yes also any reliability or risk issues that you're currently facing uh, so the question is uh, anything to add on the reliability and risk issues. So 
the one of the risks is that we use the visual serving to see if where it has to dump for the second dump. So the, for the first deposit, it can dump wherever it navigated to. But for the second deposit, it has to dump exactly where it had first deposited. And there might be uh, errors in navigation while reaching that point, which so we cannot completely rely on navigation. So in visual serving, it is completely possible that if the point cloud or uh, the depth is distorted, that it might not detect where that first dump or deposit was. And that is, uh, we handle that as a failure case, uh, which Vibhakar can talk uh, more about. Uh, yeah, so that is definitely a failure case. So in the case where it does not detect any material, uh, any deposition in its vicinity, currently the behavior that is it, it's following is that it just deposits the material wherever it navigated to. And uh, we would like to improve that in uh, the future by adding recovery behaviors to kind of uh, see the entire area around it and uh, navigate to the berm that it had built previously. And uh, also to uh, talk about the uh, reliability of the system, currently we've tested the system multiple times and uh, we're happy to say that this was its around 11th to 12th successful run without any issues. And we've tested this more than 10 times before this. So it seems to be pretty reliable, at least for the straight berm that we're building in this demo. I would also like to add on to that answer. Uh, so another issue that we face is traversing over this soil. So the husky is not designed for operating in uh, like a sandy terrain. And uh, yeah, and uh, basically uh, because of that, uh, what happens is that if our uh, path tracking, our path generated is very, very uh, sharp, the husky is not able to track that path because of a very high uh, minimum turning radius of the husky in this terrain. So that's another problem that we face. Why does it take twice the time to load the bucket as it does to dump the bucket? So, uh, it, uh, so the system is capable of excavating in a much lesser time. Uh, currently in the demo, we excavate for about 60 seconds. The system is capable of excavating in 45 and even 40 seconds, which we've tested. The uh, reason we do not do that is when we are doing excavation very aggressively, it has to take very deep cuts in the uh, terrain. And we do not want that because we want to keep the terrain traversable. We want to take very shallow cuts because that is the principle behind the multiple cutting edges of low gravity excavation. So we want to keep shallow uh, cuts. So we have an extended period of excavation time, which uh, essentially is because it's only taking a slight amount of material per uh, rotation and the dump is uh, it, it it doesn't have to dump slowly it can dump all of the material it has so we have no limitation in depositing the material that's why the time difference in the operations uh to add to that add to that because of the autodic controller uh, like during uh, while excavating the uh, the the losses rubbing against the sand is higher and therefore for the same power the angular velocity also decreases as compared to dumping when it's much of a free rotation. You guys know roughly how many kgs of sand this berm required? Uh, so it's about six dumps. Six dumps averaged about uh, eight okay. kgs is 24. Uh, yeah, so uh, the question was how many uh, kgs of sand is required to build this berm? So it uh, excavated for six dumps. Okay. Uh, for, yeah, so it required about uh, 48 kgs of uh, sand. Yeah, so it's 15 minutes where each of the excavation cycle is a little less than three minutes. Thanks so much. Yeah. Of course, you have <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for attending our demo.